few months ago, William Schneider Jr. arrived at the Caps Media Center with an absolute treasure trove of Ventura history. Bill's father, William Schneider Sr., was a highly respected teacher throughout Ventura. For years, his hobby was recording on camera interviews and family histories with fascinating people all over the county. Recently, his son, Bill Jr., gathered together more than 100 tapes from his father's archives and working here at the Caps Media Center has painstakingly restored these treasures. Bill's new series, called My Father's Stories, explores some of the very early days of Ventura County. Most of the videos were recorded 20 to 30 years ago. The people, places, and stories Bill shares are part of Ventura's rich history. Welcome to My Father's Stories. This is such an amazing resource you brought us, such a storehouse of information. Um, how did your father go about doing it, do you know? Well, he, he retired, he was a school teacher for years. So when you're, when you're teaching a class, you're always in front of, you're always on, you know? And after he retired, he, he did two things in his career. He became a commercial TV actor and he started these shows. He, he was born and raised in Sadaquay in a Ventura area. And so he knows all these people. He actually grew up with them. These are all uh, founding fathers and early settlers and pioneering families. And he, he and his father actually were part of that. And that's how he knows these people. He knows them personally. Fabulous. And now you're bringing his stories to us. Because I want them out there in the public. That's where they belong. Great. Who, whose story have we got today? Today we're going to talk about Mark Dees. You might know Mark Dees by Mark Lloyd Dees from the Lloyd family. Mark Lloyd Dees is a descendant from Lewis Marshall Lloyd who came to this Ventura County in 1886 on a railroad promotion. Lewis was an ex-Confederate from Missouri and was a successful practicing attorney. He liked the area so much that in 1887 he, bought, he brought the whole family out. He put them all in rail cars and they rented a parlor car and they all came out in, in pretty first class actually instead of coming out in covered wagons and stuff. And they settled in the Ventura Avenue area. Right th Back then there was nothing there, nothing. And he, they built a house there which is still standing. Shortly after that, he bought 4,000 acres north of Poli Street, known as the Poli property. It was a cattle ranch that was formerly owned by a Spanish Don. But the Don was named Poli. Don Poli apparently went broke, and Lewis acquired the property from the bank and became a cattle rancher, and he stopped practicing law. Uh, then Mark D's father started drilling for oil, and Lloyd II, which was the second drilling they had, actually hit a gusher. And that whole area back there now is oil and gas. Amazing story. It is an amazing story. Let's see it. Great. Okay. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us Mark Dees. Mark's a descendant of the Lloyd family that came into this county many years ago and very well known, and you'll hear some interesting stories about oil. Stay with us. We'll be right back. back and I'd like you to meet Mark Dees. How are Hi, you? Bill. Good to see you. Good to see you. And it's been I appreciate, a long time. Yeah, I appreciate your coming in. This is great. You're a local boy from the word go, aren't you? Yes, I accidentally got born in Portland, Oregon, but I was raised in this town and yeah. I considered home and after spending quite a bit of time in Los Angeles professionally, I came back here and I intend to stay here for the rest of my life. It's a pretty good place to live. I always thought so, yeah. but it's in my blood. When did uh, your grand great-grandfather? Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather, Mr. Lloyd, come in. That was Lewis Marshall Lloyd. Mm -hmm. He was a ex-Confederate uh, Missourian, and after quite a few struggles after the Civil War and being on the losing side, he, he had done fairly well as an attorney and politician near Neosho, Missouri. 
came out here in 1886 on one of those railroad promotions where you got yeah. a cheap ticket. Yeah. And it worked in his case because uh, he liked the land and brought his family back in 1887. Yeah. And where did he settle? He bought the old Poli property, you, mm -hmm. you know Poli yeah. Street. Well, he didn't buy it from the original uh, you, Spanish Don Poli yeah. that owned it, but he came into that property. He acquired about 4,000 acres, uh, which included most of the property that now is behind the city of Ventura. People wonder who owns that property. Yeah. It's the descendants of L Lewis Marshall Lloyd, and there's about 400 of us. Really? Oh, maybe 300. That's I, I haven't <laughs> counted them lately. <laughs> That's a big family. Cousins, yeah. in-laws. And they all were cut in. That's yes, the, not without a bunch of wrangling and lawsuits in the early days about who got what, but uh, as the generations have been born, the old animosities have been pretty much forgotten and uh, they work together reasonably, harmoniously, if at a distance at this time. Okay, now Lewis Lloyd landed here as an attorney. What well, yes, do? but I don't think he ever practiced in California. He became a rancher, and then due to the efforts of, primarily of one of his sons, my grandfather, Ralph Lloyd, he found himself in the oil business uh, toward the end of his life. But cattle ranching was his occupation. To the end of his days, he never thought there was any oil inventory. He thought the family zinc mine, which we still own and has produced nothing in 50 years, would always be a greater boon than any of that stuff that came out of the ground out that here. That oil. <laughs> got in the way of the, got in the creeks and messed yeah, them up. Yeah, messed up all the drinking holes. Yeah. Well, there surely are some early stories about uh, Grandpa Lewis there. Well, the most famous story is the one I call the burning bush, and this has become part of California oil legend. He saw a fire at a distance, what he thought was a brush fire, and he rode his horse closer to take a look at it, and suddenly he was surrounded by the flames and had to gallop for his life through this sea of flames. And he came to a canyon, and the horse wouldn't go into the canyon, as I understand it, and he jumped off the horse and rolled down the slope and got away all burnt and frightened yeah. and the horse was burned to death. And he came staggering home and told the story and the women all said, oh, it's Moses in the burning bush. Yeah. But my, <laughs> so the story goes, yeah. my grandfather knew better, knew it was a, a, a natural gas seeping from the ground and remembered that and years later was if I can go on. Sure. After studying at the University of California, studying geology for about three years around the turn of the century, he eventually came back to Ventura. He had made a stake in Portland in the pipe business and drilled a well with a partner named Joseph Dabney and at that time a man named Miley called uh, Lloyd Number One up Ventura Avenue. And just like in the movies, it came in just like James Dean and Giant, Cub Bluey. The only trouble was that was it. They had hit a gas pocket, oil and everything flew all over, and the gas pressure was so great it destroyed the rig. What oil there was ran off down the Ventura River. Oh. And in effect, the old oil men looked at him and said, ah, it's pretty good, Lloyd. Pity that the technology won't let you handle it. I don't think they used the word technology. Yeah. Pity we haven't got a rig that'll handle it. And he kept trying it. I've got a picture here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. State Consolidated Oil Company. That was his first venture. Yeah. And this is him and the straw boater. Yeah, let's see that. With his partners, Miley and Dabney. Yeah. And Lloyd one and Lloyd two. This is apparently if I've got my stories correct, yeah. before they blew up. Sure. Or maybe after they blew up and they rebuilt them. And that's Lloyd too, the second Lloyd one. Lloyd too. These and were, in effect, the oil was there, but they were effective busts. And he was virtually bankrupt by 1916 when a man named Vanderlinden came along representing the Royal Dutch Shell, our present Shell Oil Company, which yeah. people may not realize is controlled in Holland and London, though the U.S. operation is huge. Yeah. What are these right in here, Mark? Uh, 
That's a steam powered draw works. That's, it's all that's run a by steam boilers to run the steam, just like an old steam engine. Yeah. And my memory as a child going with my father, his uh, son-in-law, who was active in the business back in the uh, 30s and 40s, we might say the glory years of the Ventura Avenue oil field. Yeah. I remember going up there at night and watching the rigs, the light shining through the, the clouds of fog and steam and the thudding of the earth as these great steam-powered draw works ran the, the block yeah. and the, the uh, I forget the name, the traveling crane that runs the yeah. pipe in and out of the hole and the, the, the noise of the, the strings of casing and, and tubing being run down the hole. It was, it almost brings tears to my eye. It was as exciting as seeing an express train rushing by behind a steam locomotive. Yeah. Um, did, uh, w I'm sorry, w was your family involved in the actual solving of this gas problem, which was holding up the production of this field? I'm sure that my grandfather's problems became well known because, of course, they became Shell's problems. Mm -hmm. Shell had so much trouble with Ventura trying to control these gas pockets that, that blew out on them yeah. that uh, they sold the eastern half of the field to, to Associated, which through a number of mergers and acquisitions is now Getty, mm -hmm. and to recoup some of their losses. Vander Linden's career was nearly destroyed by all the money he dropped for Shell and Ventura, but later he became head of operations worldwide. and. He, uh, his, his vision was vindicated. The fellow who had a lot to do with Venter Avenue technology was Fritz Hunsinger, the late Fritz Hunsinger who founded Vetco. And a lot of Vetco's deep, deep rigs down 15,000 feet. We had a world record depth at one brief moment in the, the uh, mid 40s. Uh, that was Fritz Hunsinger and his crew out there at Vetco. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the ranching again. There are two trees that's a common city landmark here. Tell us a little bit about those. Well, I believe I'm safe in stating that my grandfather and his brothers planted those trees mm -hmm. under the direction of their father. I do know that my grandfather always claimed to have helped plant and later watered those palm trees. I guess there's some left, I haven't noticed lately, that line the part of Main Street near the studio here. Yeah. The east, the old East End. Yeah. That was palm trees. Yeah, the palm trees. You mentioned a string of trees, of which these two trees are the only remnants. I don't remember those, and I don't remember talk of it, but there may have been such a thing. Okay. Uh, did did the family ever talk about droughts? Oh my! Very gosh. common topic now. Yes, but yes, but we've had worse. Sure. Thank God, I I'm too young to have remembered them, and maybe you are too. <laughs> but uh, my grandfather was so appalled by having to walk out with his colt and shoot his cattle because they were dying of yeah. thirst, that when he made some money in the oil business, he invested it in Oregon. You know, where the water was. Where the water was. Yeah. He, he always seemed to carry a, a grudge against the water system or the water situation here. Now we have a much better water system, but I think we haven't seen our worst drought yet. You may be shooting cattle around here before we're through. Well, now they haul them off to yeah, Oregon. Yeah, I guess they'll take them to market first. Haul them to Oregon, yeah. yeah. Uh, how many years did it take uh, Ralph to bring in this shell number one? Was it a... Well, it was actually the first big well, say 4,000 barrels a day, you know, yeah. oh boys, we got a well here. <laughs> that sort of thing was in the mid-20s, I'd say about 1925 or 26, and I believe it was associated as Lloyd number nine. They called it Lloyd because it was on the Lloyd lease, being yeah. the Lloyd family. Yeah. And uh, that set them going and they never he never looked back. Okay, but there were some lean years in there. Oh, terrible lean years. Ten years between the first uh, gas pocket job that I just told you about and a really controlled gusher. Yeah, something you put in the tank. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And then Ventura, I would say, 
became about the third most important oil area in California after, I hope I have this right, Colinga in the San Joaquin Valley and the Signal, area, Signal Hill, Los Angeles Basin Area. Do you want to hear a story about Signal Hill? Got 60 seconds. All right. During those lean years, my grandfather had, and his brothers, had leases on the Signal Hill area. And they went to Shell, who were represented at that time by a guy named, another Dutchman named Van Horst Pelican. Say that again. That's a great name. Van Horst Pelican. <laughs> I hope I've got that right. That's a great name. He said, that with, this is a marvelous play. And he says, Lloyd, haven't you got enough troubles with Ventura? I don't want to hear about it. So other people took over the signal leases, including my grandfather's old partner, Joseph Dabney. And there's a lot of his people still running around, too, his descendants. Well, that little decision cost Shell Oil Company, they figure, what, $2 billion not having Signal Hill? Oh, yeah. And though they later got part of it. And every time Pelican would see my grandfather at oil gatherings, he'd turn and walk away. Walk away. Couldn't bear to talk to him. We'll be right back. Okay, great story. <laughs> Let's talk about family now. Okay. <laughs> you, we have this great picture. This is? This is Ralph B. Lloyd, my grandfather, the, the oil man we're talking about, and his oil, oil baron is this guys. The, That's the way I remember him. Is this the pose that he was famous for, just like that? Yes, he was supposed to be kind of a grumpy, grouchy old tyrant, but I thought he was a pussycat. Yeah. He died in 1953, and I. that's just the way I remember him at the breakfast table telling me to chew my food properly. <laughs> really? Yes. Now, you have Never another heard. charming lady here. This uh, beauty is my grandmother as she looked about the time of her marriage in, I would say, should have looked this up, 1903, 1904. Yeah. My mother, the oldest daughter, was born in 1905. She was a school marm up Wheeler Canyon. Oh. And the house that she taught in, the schoolhouse, has been converted to a residence and is still there. Yeah. Uh, and how say. did they meet? Did, did oh, you? he was riding by on his cow pony and before saw, the oil business started. Yeah, and saw this pretty school marm. Got to check out the school marm, Ralph. Isn't That's what he heard. He was all right. Hey, here's a family outing. Now, are yes. You, you're he, not in any of these yet, are you? No, I'm not even a gleam in anybody's eye. <laughs> but this is my mother and her sister, Elizabeth Davis. You, you know the Davis ranches out in yeah. uh, Oxnard? That, she married the late Tom Davis yeah. later. And this is her mother, and this is Hubbard Russell. Hub Russell. Yes, he's a pioneer type. Yeah. And uh, his wife, Reba, who was my grandmother's sister. And this, this is Hub here. Well, and uh, this is Ralph. There's some, there's some stories. Yes, this is my grandfather at the wheel. I wish I knew what kind of car that was, because as you know, that's my We'll find line. out. And we're going to talk about old cars pretty soon, too. But you said Hub Russell. What about oil in Cuyama now? Were you folks ever involved in oil up there? No, that was Hubbard's thing. And, and though there was a relation there, there was no business connection at any time that I'm aware of. The Russell brothers had property in what is now Thousand Oaks and Agoura. And they also had this, I thought, kind of godforsaken spread in the Cuyama. It was. It was. <laughs> and my father, uh, Jut Dees, Justin Dees, who you knew in yeah. the old days, he, he has now passed on. Um, working for his father-in-law after first working for Shell, was sent up in the late 40s and early, maybe in the early 50s. I remember the occasion, but I can't think of the date, to check out the Cuyama for my grandfather's brother-in-law, Hub. Would there be any oil there? And my father, like many others, said, not a drop. Came back, says, worthless. But there was some crazy guy who finally convinced Richfield to drill and the next thing you know, we've got a Cuyama oil field. And Hub Russell, the cattleman, had a sign in his office that said, there is no cow so fat as the one that rubs its back against an oil derrick. <laughs> Probably got that from some Texan. Yeah, that's a good one. Hub was kind of character, and uh, uh, his descendants, Hub Russell Jr., I guess, my second cousin, is uh, still up there. And I see him, talk to him on rare occasions. Are they still in the cattle business? I expect so. Yeah. I expect so. Oil business is probably going downhill a little bit, isn't it? 
Yes, I've heard the Cuyama field is, has been greatly depleted, but the price of oil going up, they may be able to eke out a few pennies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other old oil wells around this county? You spoke of... Well, there's always those up behind Fillmore, up Piru Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting. You can still find boilers at the bottom of canyons. And I guess someday they'll be saying that about the Ventura Avenue field. But still that field is going thanks to uh, uh, secondary and tertiary recovery methods. Now, tell us about that. Well, this is a controversial subject because the gas pockets that created so much trouble and the, the natural gas that forced so much oil to the surface uh, is gone. There's still gas down there, but it's no under, longer under such pressure. So they use water flood to float the oil to the surface. Mm -hmm. And many of these old wells that were great producers have been converted to injection wells by Texaco. Now, I said earlier Getty. Okay. Texaco in a monumental corporate bust up took over Getty. You've read okay. heard about that. So it's now Texaco. And a competent outfit they are, but it's difficult, expensive work to to keep this water flood going. And a lot of that water is the water that uh, is sold to them by the city of Ventura. And people say that should be going on their lawns. But it's my understanding that that water is well and truly paid for. And it's brackish partly seawater. They cut a lot of seawater okay. into it. It's blended and with seawater. It's not taking it away from anybody. Yeah. But that's a subject that I suppose you could devote an entire program to. We'll do it sometime. Okay, you've had some interesting careers now. We've talked about some great people in the past. What have you done with your life since you left? Well, I want to say in spite of the fact that I'm sitting here as the scion of an oil baron, that there were a lot of us in the while I'm fortunate of, in that respect, I've uh, worked most of my life mainly as a criminal prosecutor in the Los Angeles area. I'm former assistant United States attorney. And as a hobby, I have built and raced and restored old cars and uh, researched their history and have written several articles and a major reference work on the subject. American. American, American cars. cars. Yeah. Um, what's the old? Do you have a you have a collection? You said I think. Yes, I've got a couple of Stutzes and a and a forty-seven Packard and a thirty-eight Buick and. Are they all running? Oh no, no, no. Oh, right. That's that's the great disgrace. We I've got a. Oh, well, I should have I, asked that. Yes, either. I should. <laughs> I've, for the rest of my life, I'll be trying to get them running. Yes, half of them run. Well, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, and a couple of them run very well indeed. Yeah. And I've gone to the Bonneville Salt Flats uh, and raced hot rods there. Have you? Yes. What's the best speed you've had? 262 miles an hour. And what did you do that in? The world's fastest go-kart. It was a, a belt-driven <laughs> streamliner with a big block Chevy in it. Belt-driven? It happened to be driven by belts. It'd take a long time to explain it. Okay. Take my word for it. It's the world's fastest belt-driven car. Gilmer belts, you know, the, with the big tooth teeth yeah, on them? Yeah, yeah. Geared, geared teeth? Sure. And then you've got a record and a big trophy for that. I'm no, not, because I didn't break the record and the car had other problems. But I have broken other records, have but you? with more conventional cars, a roadster. Okay. You know. A speed record? Yeah, yeah. And well, motorcycles, too. Where do you ride, where do you race motorcycles? Down the salt Same, flats. Out salt on the flats. salt flats. Yeah. Nothing lately, but in the past. You've given this up? No, no. I just... Uh, I'm still working on them, but there's a lot of other things to do too, and it's I'm not fully committed to it. Others would disagree with They're that. They're still hobbies, right? Still yeah. hobbies, supposedly. But the 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 his, history and the writing about them I no longer consider a, a hobby. It's as much a vocation as practicing law. More now. That's neat. You're going to be a speaker. You promised at our Model A Club. Yes, I'll tell you how to hop the old devils up. Oh boy. Okay, those were the days. Now, you're doing something in Moore Park. Oh, I'm just developing some right. property out there as, as a home. And I've uh, got a couple of rail co road cars on a spur behind the Lager Mercino Beer Warehouse. And uh, I've, I'm working on these old Pullman cars and charter them out. You have to get them to a certain mechanical standard and yeah. you can hitch them to an Amtrak train and Off go, go almost anywhere Amtrak goes.
Well, that's if right. you can pay the, buy yeah. the ticket. Yeah. That's it, why I have to get a bunch of friends with me before I can go anywhere. How, can, do I dare ask what it costs a day to get towed around like that? Amtrak charges you between uh, about two dollars and ten cents and a dollar forty-five a mile, depending on how far you go. Oh, that's not bad, is not it? Not if you have a bunch of people with you. Sure. But to think of going from here to New York and back. Oh. Think of the ticket cost. Well, you don't do it too often. I'm not that fond of New York. Either. You you have to really pump those oil wells. I mean, go to Quam or something like that would be all right, no. would it? <laughs> um, now, how about horses? You have, I, I noticed... Well, the family always was horse crazy, Well, you came, including my daughter. You came by it naturally then? Oh, very much and, so. Uh, and, and what do you have in the way of horses? Do you ride? Yes, I ride uh, a half Appaloosa, half Arabian on endurance rides, which is another form of racing. I really love to yeah. race. I love the competition. I've never heard of this. Well, it's a long-distance horse race. You go about 50 or 100 miles on your horse, and every 10 or 12 miles, they stop the horse. Well, they call it a pit stop, just like I was sure. racing. Or vet check, actually. Yeah. And the veterinarian inspects your horse to make sure that he's not being abused anyway. And if he shows any signs of fatigue or lameness, you have to trot him out, and they take his pulse rate. If he shows any undue situation Stress. that might hurt him, yeah. you're out. You're out. Just well, like a, in a baseball game, you're out. Well, now, who checks the rider? I mean, after... Oh, they don't care about them. They don't care about They're them. humans. They can take care of themselves. Now, <laughs> where do these horse races take place? Oh, out in the desert. Uh, we put on one all around the old Union Oil. You asked where the oil, old oil wells were. Right. There's a bunch up at the end of Wheeler Canyon, and the Union Oil let me run a vent like this together with a riding club in Ojai, all around their property. And it worked out very well. And as we rode along, I could see Union Oil number five, old cable rigs, you remember those? Yeah. Amazing. They're up there. So, uh, And they're still recovering oil, where they, you said they were. I guess they must be, or they wouldn't be maintaining the property and keeping the cable rigs operating. Some of them look a little derelict, but now that the price of oil is inching up, it, it's amazing the effect it has. It makes a given rig more profitable. We have about 60 seconds. Do you want to talk briefly about our situation with the oil countries at this time? I don't consider myself an oil expert. Okay. I, I've done legal work in oil. The, uh, everybody thinks that we're over there to get for the oil, that we wouldn't be risking these, the, this man and all this material just to get oil. But would we be there if somehow Saddam Hussein had quietly persuaded Saudi Arabia to raise the price of oil? Would we be in there with our troops? Oil is one factor. We don't want the control of the world's oil and the world's oil prices in the hands of a madman. But we're there, I think, and rightly so, to deter aggression. And I support the president and what he seems to be proposing to do. Mark, I thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. It's been a great nice to sound great off. Great chat. We've been visiting with Mark Lloyd Dees. Good night. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.